Welcome to Wake Up. I'm Damon. He's Larry. You are a sports fan craving a better show, and that's exactly what we tend to bring to you. It's what we want to bring to you. And beginning next Monday, we'll be bringing it to you three days a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We'll be going around 830 Larry, we're going to have to start setting your alarm just to, to like five minutes earlier. And that way everything goes smoother and no one's calling you lazy. How are you, pal? Doing great. Doing great. Happy Monday, uh, February the 26th to everybody. Hope everybody's uh, enjoying a Monday after a phenomenal weather weekend in the Bay Area, man. It was just absolutely glorious. Oh, not great. I was over at the A's Fan Fest, put on by fans. I saw no, that. I saw no that. support at all of the team. It was a beautiful day, just a gorgeous day over in Oakland. Thousands of happy people, angry at their ownership, but very, very happy to be together. And it was a really nice day for the community. So I was in a good mood. I'm glad you were in a good weather, good mood, Larry. And we want to make sure Niners fans are going to be in a good mood. And for that, we need answers. And the answer is to this question. Who is the next defensive coordinator? The search continues or the announcement continues to be delayed, I guess, here, Larry. We've been all over the candidates. I think we've talked about them probably more than any other show out there. Who it might be, we both have that Bill Belichick pipe dream. We'll talk more about whether or not that is a pipe dream or not, um, uh, or if this is coming from inside the house, if you will. Uh, from, from the wish list to the real list to the maybe not list, how are you feeling this is, is going to shake up? We both incorrectly predicted that we would have this answer by end of business on Friday to the point where on Friday I thought, all right, if we're going to hear about it today, it's going to be like an unpopular choice. It's going to be Brandon Staley and it's going to be a Friday news dump. Didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I got to think that if they were going to hire from within, it would have already happened. Let me first shout out pig and a pickle, the title sponsor of the Krug show, as well as underdog fantasy um marin autoglass and our two new sponsors sharp corner sports cards and collectibles and valleyhillroofing.net just for the month of february we thank them for joining us and uh, we'll have more on all of our sponsors and of course the links are in the description and damon why don't you I'm just gonna shout out right your now. incredible sponsors as well Ike, get yourself a sandwich at ike's you'd be happy you got a sandwich at ike's they're freaking delicious they're available all over the west coast get the damon bruce you're going to want a Damon Bruce. So there you go. Get, <laughs> there yourself, you go. get yourself to Ike's. And that's all I got right now. And uh, we will be having this show sponsored, of course. Uh, if you're interested, reach out to me or Larry. The amount of views will be in the millions. Millions. So millions. Incredible, incredible exposure. Um, and, and we certainly love our sponsors who continue to support us. You, without sending a single dollar our way can support us by just hitting like subscribing to either channel whether you're watching on larry's channel please subscribe to damon bruce if you're watching over here on the plus make sure you're subscribing to the krug show and you won't miss a thing um as you were saying about yeah well i just coordinator yeah yeah i just don't think it's going to be an internal hire i mean if you really had an internal guy you wanted to hire and it was the priority you would have hired him by now um, and, uh, I do believe they're, you know, you don't run off a guy like Steve Wilkes while he's under contract after he had a top 10 defense in yards, top five in points allowed per game and was, you know, pretty damn good in the super bowl for the most part. Um, you don't run that guy off to give it to somebody who has no credentials, just trying it for the first time or is in-house, and you could have named him last year, the D.C. To me, the only thing that makes sense here is the big name D.C. Now, Gus Bradley, uh, Jeff Ulbrich, um, Chris Kiffin, those names have been thrown out. Kiffin's not a big name. I was about to, I, that was, I was about to ask you, do you think Chris Kiffin is a big name? I actually, if he's the higher Larry, I like it. I, he's he's not a big name though. He could be, but he's not on that real wish list that involves Vrabel, Pete Carroll, Bill Belichick, you know, Ron Rivera. If you even want to put his name on the list, I don't think that that's really going to be an option though. Um, 
It, uh, he is a big name from the standpoint, Damon, that he's connected to a big name. And Chris Kiffin is very connected to Aziz Al Shair. And if the 49ers want to land Al Shair, maybe Kiffin is their ticket to bringing him back. But you're right. In and of itself, Chris Kiffin is not a big name. But Bill Belichick is. Gus Bradley is. Um, I don't know if Jeff Ulbrich is, but he, and I don't know that Ulbrich would they'd have to offer him the assistant head coaching job because he's the DC in New York with the jets right now. You can't do a lateral move type situation in this, in this deal. So um, yeah. So <clears throat> is it Vrabel? Is it Belichick? Is it Carroll? Is it Gus Bradley? Is it Chris Kiffin? Um, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure who it is, but I do think it, when we hear the name, it's going to be a bigger name and not a smaller name. That would be my guess. Lynn- yeah, I, I, I'm leaning in that direction too. You know, any movie, Larry, any movie that involves a jury decision, there's always a scene in every movie that involves a jury where the lawyers are talking to their client and they go over, well, the amount of time it takes to deliberate is either working for us or against us, right? You know, the amount of time this jury is out is a good thing or it's a bad thing. Which is it? Do you attach any good thing or bad thing to this taking longer than I think both of us expected it would take? Do you drift into the, it means they're already, you know, knocking on a second door on choice B or C? Or do you think it's just a high-level negotiation and these things take time? Um, As you said, there's no way they let go of Steve Wilkes without a plan. It feels like it wouldn't take very long to execute that plan, at least not this long. So is any of this sitting on well with you at all? No, I mean, I've been saying, I've been talking Belichick for over a month. And I, I really believe that they offered him the job. And Peter King went on the radio last week, and we'll talk more about Peter today because Peter announced his retirement today. But um, <clears throat> he went on the radio locally last week and said, I wouldn't be shocked if Kyle Shanahan offered the job to Bill Belichick. And then if you are going to offer a job you know, like this that's beneath Bill Belichick to Bill Belichick, um, but when it's also – beneath him and also the far and away the best football job he's going to get offered to him uh, this off season. I think that you got to give him some time to think it over. And that's why I, I really believe Mike Silver. Uh, Mike Silver has reported that word around the league is that they've just talked internally. Yeah, because I don't think when you're, if you're going to offer the job, like I believe it's been offered to Bill Belichick. Um, I don't think you offer it to anybody but him and there is no other candidate. And if you want to, you know, you don't bum rush him, you give him plenty of time. And also this is probably a tricky financial negotiation because if I'm right and it's Belichick, he's going to get record setting defensive coordinator money. So I'm, you know, it's, it is wild. It would absolutely be the biggest story in the NFL all week outshining the combine itself. Um, But I think the 49ers, I think it works, Damon. Why? Because of Bill's relationship with Eddie, Eddie's ties to the team, um, the fact that Bill, this is the best job Bill could get. I think this is also a major check your ego moment at the door for both Kyle Shanahan and Bill Belichick, which is why I think it actually works. Uh, because I think they both have to check their ego at the door, you know, and, and at this point, I think, you know, there's a lot of people like, oh, Kyle Shanahan would never do that because then if they won the Super Bowl, it would be viewed as Belichick helped get him over the top. And all I would say to that is I think Kyle Shanahan at this point just Fair. wants to get over the top and does not care how it looks, who says what. You know, there were an awful lot of people in 1994, 1995, Damon. You were around in the market at that time, um, <clears throat> you know, working at Sports Byline over with me and, and the great Todd Herson. Um, a lot of people said back in, in January and February of 1995, you know what? Nobody's ever going to look at this Niners Super Bowl the same because they had Dion 
And this will be the one they had to go get Dion to get him over the top. Well, here we are. It's 2024, and nobody says, well, the Niners have four, and they've got that one with Dion. They say the Niners have five. So nobody's going to remember, you know, um, which ones you won with KD and which ones you didn't win with KD. No one's going to remember which ones you won with Dion and without Dion. Nobody's going to care which ones you won with Belichick and without over time. Maybe, maybe Nick Wright and a few talking heads on in the present will highlight, um, you know, that this is somehow disrespectful or, you know, some kind, not a full achievement, but history will remember it as a full achievement. Shanahan's keenly aware of that. And so I, I, I really believe Kyle's at that point now where he doesn't care what it takes to get beyond Reed and Spagnolo. And if it takes him and Bill to get by Reed and Spagnolo, so be it. Um, I said this over a month ago. I'll stay with it now. I think it's the I think he's the higher. And 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 it's just a matter of does he want it? Will he take it? Does he view it? Does he want to ride off into the sunset and do nothing? Because those are his choices. Ride off into the sunset and do nothing, or be a defensive coordinator on one of the great teams in the league and on an iconic team. So I think I think it's going to get done. I think it's going to be a major story, but um, we'll see. We'll see. I do understand the the people who push back in a big bad way, going, "It's preposterous." It it does seem preposterous. Well, Larry, um, he's the, so I get he, it. He's the ultimate overqualified hire, right? I mean, he's yeah, the most totally. overqualified defensive coordinator in the history of anyone taking that position. If he does take that position. But in a game of musical chairs, the man has nowhere to sit in terms of being a head coach anywhere in the NFL. There is zero chance he goes back to college. So now the question is, do you want a coach? Because if Bill Belichick was too old this year to get a head coaching job, a year older, a year removed from the league doesn't do him any favors. Are you a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm? Do you ever watch the show? It's so funny you said that. I did a Curb Your Enthusiasm um, marathon on, uh, on what Saturday, Friday night, or I guess it was Saturday night, okay. Saturday night. I watched all of the very latest season 12 of okay. Curb Your Enthusiasm. So, so yes, a couple of seasons ago, the plot was Larry was going to open his own coffee shop next to Mocha Joe's right. and it's a spite store. My question is, Larry, how much does Bill <laughs> Belichick want to open a spite store against the NFL? Because the old, nobody thinks I'm worth hiring as a head coach. All right, fuck you guys. I'm going to go join Kyle Shanahan. He's going to be the best offensive mind in the league. I'm going to be the best defensive mind in the league. You want to say that he can't win it on his own? He doesn't care anymore. You talk about how people were going to remember it. Forget about what everyone's going to remember. Here's what everyone knows. Kyle's lost two Super Bowls. He can't afford to go to a third and lose that one, too. To bring to bear the very best team with the very best coaches is the job. You bring the full might of all NFL power to bear with this roster, that head coach, that defensive coordinator. Just think of Bill Belichick being the wartime consigliere that every 49er can walk up to and just get every drop of NFL knowledge from. The man is a walking, talking, living football historian, much less coach. There's no aspect of the league he isn't acutely aware of. And all, here's my pitch to Bill Belichick. Here's the elevator pitch, Larry. Are you ready? Lean over to Bill and just say, X's and O's, and it never snows. That's all you need to know, Bill. You don't have to deal with the media. You don't have to deal with Tom Curran. You don't have to deal with Boston up your ass. You don't have to deal with anyone asking you stupid questions with your monotone answers just being served to them, and they don't stop no matter how disinterested you seem. All of the things that you can't stand about football vanish instantly and all the things that you love X's and O's and relationships with players are still there. Uh, to me, there's got to be a pile of money that is big enough to put that with all the other things that I just talked about in front of bill to make him go. 
yeah, you know what? I am going to open a spite store in Santa Clara and take it out on the NFL for not hiring me. And Broken Metronome says, Larry saying Kyle has no ego. What the fuck has he been watching the past seven or eight years? I didn't say he had no ego. I said he's going to check his ego at the door. And Belichick's got an ego, uh, and he's going to check his at the door. That's why it works, because both guys have, in theory, something to lose, right? Both guys are taking, you know, Kyle is admitting that he needs help and Belichick's admitting that he needs a top tier football job and he doesn't have one and that he, and, but, but it works because at his, at both men's men's core is this, they claim to be all about football. And if it's all about football, I don't think Shanahan wants to get on the headsets in the middle of the Super Bowl. I don't think he wants to sit there and and ha- and question is this the right you know when he's sitting there between series does he sit does he want to sit there and go is this the right coverage call on defense he wants to be able to hand the keys to the defense to somebody else and say hey wait a second you de- you take these keys you run with it I don't want to I want to have total trust so that's where I think Belichick works I it's really the do. And the only thing is money. Player. It's about money for Bill because I mean, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that, but he made 25 million and Kyle's making like 14, five. I don't think the Niners are going to pay their defensive coordinator 25 million, but I do think they may offer him a two year, $25 million deal uh, with maybe most of it guaranteed in the first year. So he's like, Hey, you know what? Um, How about this? We'll offer you a $25 million two-year deal, 20 in year one, five in year two, and you don't owe us anything if, uh, you know, if you want to ride off into the sunset. Therefore, he gets close to what he, um, you know, was going to make as a head coach this year, which is record-setting D.C. money. And, you know, you get your guy. Um and I and I think you know it makes sense for Kyle right now. It makes sense for for Belichick right now, um, <clears throat> and it really makes sense when you look at the 49ers roster, because Bill Belichick is a great defensive coach. They need to retool their defensive line, and they need to um, coach up their secondary, and that's really a big thing. I mean, you look at that secondary. They've invested in young players here. Looter, Jair Brown, uh, even Mooney Ward's not very old. Hafonga's young. Womack's young. Ambry's young. Demo's young. I mean, they, they've they got six or seven young DBs. They probably need to draft a couple more in this draft. The other reason I think this works is the Niners, maybe you get a guy like Belichick to bring in Kyle Duggar with, with them and, or, or, a, or a Josh Oshie. Uh, Ushi, I should say, both those guys are exactly what the Niners are looking for. That speed rusher opposite Bosa and kind of the leader of their secondary. And I think they're both Patriots who played for Bill and he might be able to influence one of them to come with. So I know it's crazy talk. I know it's over the top, Um, but you know what? I don't don't think it's all that crazy. And by the way, MF has this one. Damon Kawakami just now industry sources last week thought the 49ers would have been ready to announce a new defense coordinator by now, but there's quote, obviously been a bit of a delay and some potential things to sort out. So we, we shall see. All right. You can make that go away. We don't need to yeah. see MF is uh, his comment, but thank you very much. I just, I think that the reason why it's not crazy The reason why it's not insane is because Bill Belichick does not have another option. There is no professional head coaching or defensive coordinating position open anywhere else in this league. So the question is simply this. Bill, do you want to keep going? Do you want to keep coaching? Is this sport so intertwined in your veins, in your blood, that you need it to feel normal. Because you know what would feel abnormal? 
Bill Belichick on a Sunday sitting on ESPN's NFL live set pretending to have a conversation that he gives a rip about actually having with anyone up there. That is abnormal. To me, I see Bill Belichick in a defensive coordinator position more normally than I see him just, hey, I'm another media guy. You know what I mean? Totally. I mean, he's not going to yuck it up on some panel. He's not going to, hey, Bill, make a great point about defense, but make it in 40 seconds because we've got to get a live shot with Jeff Darlington. No, no, <laughs> he's just not, he's not doing that. I don't see him doing that. Um, you know, he, Kyle prides himself on being all football, that he's all football. And Belichick prides himself on being all football. And so, in some ways, this is a challenge to both of them. Are you all football? If you're all football, then what do you care about who gets the credit? You know, you just want to win. You just want to contribute to a winner. So, I think there's a relationship there between, I mean, Kyle told me that before he watches Niner film, that he watches the Patriots. And I said, and this is a couple of years ago. I said, because of Brady? And he's like, no, because of Belichick. So he watches Patriot defense every week to look for innovative and interesting defensive coordinator things. Okay. Kyle also told me, I, I think it was two years ago now, that, and I forget the context, but it was like, he, he volunteered this. Hey, if I had a good defensive coordinator, and Bill Belichick was available, I'd be smart to fire my good defensive coordinator and go hire Bill Belichick. And then with Belichick already gone through all the coaching interviews and the cycles open and closed, Shanahan gets rid of a, of a, of a, of a defensive coordinator with experience late in the process without lots of options available. Um, who has a, you know, who is top 10 in total D and top five in points allowed. You're, that's a major risk. You can't, you know, if you run off Steve Wilkes and you give the job to Daniel Bullocks and Daniel Bullocks, who's never been a DC before, falls on his face and you waste a season, that's almost a borderline fireable offense. So I, you know, um, and I agree with JJ Raider here, and that's why I have it on the board. He says if Bill Belichick wanted to spite someone, it would be the Patriots and Kraft. Bill would wait one year to see if Robert Sala gets fired and take the Jets head coaching job and beat the Patriots. Don't think he wouldn't jump to that job and don't think the 49ers wouldn't allow him to jump to that job in a year. But the one thing, JJ, you got to remember, Bill Belichick has coached every single season in the NFL since 1975. 1975, the guy's coached every year in the league. That's my lifetime. Yeah, that is my That's, entire lifetime. I was born in 1975, so that Damon's got kids, life. kids that are five. I mean, he, I was five the last time Bill Belichick did not coach in the NFL. So, to me, the more dramatic thing is to be like, is Bill not going to coach in the NFL this year? That would be incredibly dramatic. I'll so, tell you what would be even more hurtful <laughs> to the Patriots is if the Buffalo Bills come up short again and Bill Belichick were to take that job with Josh Allen. Now, all of a sudden the Patriots are officially worried. Look, yeah. The thing though about Belichick is the man is 71 years old and you know, he, he doesn't get younger this year by not coaching. And if Bill Belichick was just a little too old out of style or whatever, wanted too much power to the, galactic loser Atlanta Falcons saying thanks, but no thanks. I, I don't know if his head coaching prospects increase ever again. So this might be it for Bill. I mean, this really might be it. Look, sports are painful. When it's over, it's over. And it is sometimes painfully over. And so again, does Bill Belichick want to open a spite store? Uh, exact same scenario. Spite store certainly applies to Pete Carroll who to come from Seattle to be the defensive coordinator of the 49ers would be an in-division kerfuffle, to say the least. 
The fact that he is from Marin, the fact that he has coached for the 49ers in the past, there is an awful lot of connection and tie there. Even though he is older than Bill Belichick, he's still got that young man joie de vivre about him. And again, Pete, if all you want to do is chew gum and yell at linebackers, this is a job for you. You know, It really is. Um, do you think Pete Carroll would be interested? If, if not Belichick, would I raise you a Pete Carroll? Or at that point, are you going for much younger blood of Rabel or take a shot on Kiffin? I, I don't think Pete works as well. Um, <clears throat> why? Not that he doesn't know the defense. He knows the defense that they run maybe better. But he's got a really close relationship with John Schneider. He's got a, I mean, this, you know, it, I, I don't think for Pete Carroll to jump to the Niners at this point is scorched earth. Right. Um, you know, come on. I mean, that's scorched earth. And and I think that ruins his relationship with John Schneider. I think it 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 turns the one city that he wants to love him forever against him. I don't know. I, I think the I think there's more to lose than there is to gain there for Pete. I also kind of think Pete's kind of really wants to be done. Uh I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm reading that wrong. I would say to me, it's Belichick one, Gus Bradley two. That's what, that's how I would see it. Oh, the Gus Niners. The name, hold on, I'm sorry, but Gus Bradley's yeah. name that kind of is coming out of nowhere, at least from you and I talking about it. What leads you to Gus Bradley? Because he has coached, you know, under Sala or with Sala in this defense. He knows this defense. Uh, he's in Indy. I think you could probably. He's been a head coach. Um, you know, I think he's a, he's. You know, I, I think he's the kind of guy that would give like I think he's more likely to come than Vrabel or Carroll. And I think you could make him the assistant head coach. Well, and again, when it comes to working works. in the secondary, I mean he coached the Legion of Boom, so he knows quite a bit about that. By the way, speaking of Legion of Boom, what a disappointing story to hear about Richard Sherman, who catches a DUI, which in the age of Uber is just a Billion percent unacceptable um, for someone who is so clearly smart. How can he be so stupid? What a disappointment for Richard Sherman. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, I the one thing I always hated was um, people who used our platform to, to, um, you know, point out people who step in shit you know i i don't i i mean it's a it's a problem in our it's a societal issue um and you know i agree with everything you said as far as there's no real excuses um and it's just you know but i it, you know i don't like using my platform to be like you know this person screwed up aren't i better than them this person screwed up aren't I better than them? You know, it's, and there, I'm not saying you're doing that, but there's a lot of people that do that kind of radio and do that kind of media where it's like this person stepped in, in S and this is their worst moment ever. Let's do a segment on it and really bury him Here's when the there is no other side to it. ever. His worst moment is another well-documented moment that involved alcohol and mistakes being made. This is his what second suspected DUI again, just, you're not allowed one of those. You're certainly not allowed two of those. And in an age of Uber, dude, get your shit together. And this yeah. isn't about, well, I agree. You. This isn't about, no, being I know, but it's like, it's, just, just I, know, but it's... I guess here's the thing. What a disappointment because I really like Richard Sherman. I think that this guy could be, uh, you know, if he wanted to take that coaching path, he could be an incredible teacher of the game. Um, what a, what a guy, what, what, what a disappointment. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, it's just, no, I hear you. yeah, I'm not, I hear trying, you. I'm not trying to bury the guy, but it's absolutely pathetic that when everything that you ever needed to not get a DUI is a button on your phone and you can't bother pushing a button on your phone, I do sort of put you into the, eh, go fuck yourself lane. I mean, I really do. Like I just, it, it's inexcusable. I had a friend of mine who was killed by a drunk driver in high school. So this is a sort of a, a, a zero zero wiggle room issue of of mine. So I just I I, I can't believe he did that. Um, 
so I hear you. there you go. Sort of a tangent there. Didn't even mean to talk about Richard Sherman. Just popped up because I said Legion of Boom. But you were talking about Gus Bradley. Probably not going to be Pete Carroll. Everyone is waiting around thinking it might be Bill Belichick. What about Chris Kiffin, though? Because I think Chris Kiffin, a guy who was in-house with the Niners, left. And I kind of like that, Larry. I kind of like the guy who, yes, I was here. Then I went on to do my own thing, and now I want to come back because I'm ready for this job now. I don't think it's a bad idea either to align the coach with the single best position group on the team either, and that might be these linebackers. So to have Chris Kiffin, who is a linebackers coach, come back from D'Amico's Texas team, uh, the Houston team that was very impressive this year, I like it. I like his age. I like his youth. I like the fact that everyone who worked with him with the 49ers seems to have a glowing review and they missed him when he left. Um, I really think that Chris Kiffin is probably the most likely hire of them all. Well, it's interesting. He's, you know, okay. So he played defensive tackle at Colorado state. And of course his dad is Monty Kiffin and, and Monty Kiffin, was the DC of the Buccaneers when John Lynch won the Super Bowl. So there's a there's a trust uh, you know between Kiffin and Lynch that goes way back. The question is this, the only time Chris has been a defensive coordinator was 2017 um when he was um at Florida Atlantic. So, you know, I mean that you you're running off an, an established NFL defensive coordinator off of a pretty successful year to hand the job to a 42 year old guy who's never been a defensive coordinator in the NFL before and is currently the linebacker coach for the Texans. So, I mean, I, I think, I think he's an, he's an interesting name. It's obviously he's involved in a, in a coaching family, Shanahan's involved in a coaching family. He's got every Kubiak he's ever, who's ever, you know, been born to Gary and his wife uh, has, has stopped by the Niners staff. So obviously he believes in football families and that kind of thing. And Kiffin would go along that line. But to me, even though I like Kiffin and I think Kiffin would make sense, especially if you're going to pursue Aziz Al-Shair. Why? Because it was Kiffin who found Al Shair at Florida Atlantic and brought right, Larry, him to the all, Niners. The only thing that they need to get Aziz Al Shair back on this team is a plane ticket. <laughs> that guy showed up to a playoff game. He, yeah. he, he, he wants to be back on the 49ers. Oh, no, there's no question. There's yeah. no question. But I mean, I'm not, but, but Chris is the guy. I mean, I did an, an interview with Aziz that's up on my YouTube page from last year where I asked him about, you know, he'll come into the Niners and he had this relationship with Chris and that was the key. So that if, if, if Aziz is in their, in their, you know, designs and in their plans, then Chris makes some sense, but it's still a monumental risk to run off Steve Wilkes for Chris Kiffin. I mean, it's not like you're sitting there. Wilkes has greater credentials for the position than Kiffin does. So it's, you know, I like Chris Kiffin. I think he would be, he would be a good fit for what they do, but I think he's, I, I, I would say, Belichick one, Bradley two, Kiffin three, and then maybe Ulbrich four. That would that's how I'd rank him. Brandon Staley, yes or no? No, no. I don't. I, I you know Brandon Staley defense either quit on him. I mean, probably quit on him. Really, um, I I would say no to Brandon Staley. Yeah, anyone who gets sixty by the Raiders feels like a no, right? <laughs> It feels like it's got to be a no. It feels like there's, right. there's other issues there. Yeah. Um, so there you go. That is a 35-minute uh, opening salvo on the defensive coordinator situation that the Niners hopefully have ironed out by what? I mean, Wednesday, Thursday. They can't wait for Friday to get this done. It needs to happen because there's a lot of other things that are going to come up quickly on the NFL calendar, namely the combine and the draft. And you'd obviously like all heads together in the room thinking in the same direction before that stuff happens. Uh, hit like, hit subscribe, whether you're watching on my channel or on Larry's channel. Make sure you're subscribing to the other channel, and that way you don't miss a thing. It is great to have you here. Wake Up is becoming a three-day-a-week extravaganza. 
starting next Monday. We're going Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, weekly wake-ups, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, going forward starting on Monday of next week, which follows Sunday, Larry, which is Plus Mania 3, The Revenge, at the Halfway Club on Geneva. I'm going to be there. A whole bunch of my viewers and listeners are going to be there. And, Larry, you're going to be there, too. We're very excited to have you back. I know you made it out for Plus Mania 2. Um, invite all of your folks, all of your people, all of your crowd into the halfway club on Geneva. Let's fill the bar up. My buddy's just opened up this great bar, great food, great drinks, and it's going to be a fun day of hanging out when there really isn't anything going else on, on a Sunday. We can sit there and watch the combine together. Ooh, just, just, just sit around and, and try. I'll tell you what's amazing about the combine. You give me about five, 10, 40 times. I can condition myself to hit. I can. I don't even need a stopwatch, Larry. I'll tell you what the difference between a a four three nine and a four one. Like I, I get good at actually guessing what that forty time was. Seriously, I, I mean, myself, I got to stop watching men run around in underpants. What am I doing? Well, uh, and it, it it's so funny because it's like you know, um, it doesn't mean you you know just because you work out well doesn't mean you can play. The combine, to me should be like the haze in the barn. You know, I mean, you're, you're already, uh, you, you know, you're all, you've already decided who you like and who you don't like. And to me, the combines real value is more about, uh, the medicals <clears throat> and the interviews and the which interview. we don't, Yeah. We don't get a chance that we're not privy to the medicals and we're not privy to the interviews, but I think those are the, the highlights of the combine. And then other than that, it's nice to see these guys against a constant backdrop and see, you know, how they how they, uh, you know, measure out and everything. It's interesting. But once again, I think the Ravens do the personnel thing as well as anybody. Why? Because Ozzie Newsome is, has a philosophy and he's passed it to Eric DaCosta. And that philosophy is don't get caught up in the combine. and. um just, you know, draft great college football players and then hope they transition to the NFL. And that's what they do. To me, it's about the film, just straight up. If you didn't yeah. put it on the film collegiately, you're certainly not going to do it at the next level. And no matter what you, you may, do, but on, it's you may, but don't, you know, I agree with you. Don't that, that the for every one guy who sucked in college and then put up an awesome combine, I'd rather lose out on that guy than you know, start pretending that college football games didn't matter. Yeah. I, I just think that there's look, there, there is merit to the combine for sure. And measurables are important, but again, are we tracking things because we can, or are we tracking things because they're important? And that's, there's, it's almost like we, we have too much information and that cloudies the judgment, go to the game film, if the guy's making a lot of tackles, you should probably draft him over the guy who might be two tenths of a second faster in a 40, but doesn't make a lot of tackles, you know? So that's the way I feel about the whole thing. It is the, a player's evaluation is the entire wrapping paper of the Christmas present, right? The combine is just the bow on top. It's the last impression that the player can make on teams that are candidates who are interested in that player either through impressive physical workouts, a great interview, or just, I don't know. It's, 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 it's amazing. The decisions to draft guys at the combine come from like happenstance conversations more than they even come from the formal interviews. It's just being around the NFL and that level of media attention reveals an awful lot about a player's ability to handle the white hot microscope that comes with being drafted to an NFL team. So, um, I mean, look at it too. Look at it. Look at it. The combine Brock Purdy went there and nobody noticed who, but, but, but Zach Wilson rolled to his left and threw with his right arm, a dime down the field. And it became, he became the second pick in the draft. So it's the images are valuable, but just remember, and I'll talk more about it because I've got a point to make later on on the combine. Um, but um, but it's to me, it's like if you do know that a guy was a great college football player, right? 
it to me, it just cements things. So I'm looking for the great college football player who's also great at the combine. So that's what I'm, that's the intersection that I want. I'm not looking for guys who couldn't play who are great at the combine, but if you were great in college football and then you go to the combine and light it up, that just cements your spot on my board. You know what I mean? That's to me, because that's what the NFL is. The NFL is about next level athletes. And there's guys who are good in college football that aren't good enough athletes to, to be great in the NFL. If you can find the great college football player who goes to Indy and has a great workout, draft that guy. When you can wed collegiate production with elite athleticism, that's when you draft those guys. That's that's what you're looking for. That is like Alden Smith was a was a perfect example. He was great at Missouri, very very productive, went to the combine, looked awesome. Draft him. Now Obviously, he had problems off the field, and it derailed his career. Uh, so maybe the interviews at the combine, maybe you know, maybe should have been looked at closer there. But if you can find a great player who's also a great athlete, man, you're 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 you, that's who you want to draft. So you wanted to bring up three things needed for the 49ers to run this back, and run this back is winning the Super Bowl next year. I mean, right. that, that's that's where the 49ers are now. There's no more NFC. T- your season starts in the NFC title game. No, bullshit. Your season begins with the grand marshal of the Super Bowl parade coming up Market Street. Like that is now the only acceptable outcome for the 49ers in the 2024 NFL season. So how does that happen? How's that happen, Larry? You said you got three things that need to happen for the Niners to have any chance to run this back. What are they? Okay, and and th- this is not in the in any order. These are just three things, no particular order. One, they have to find whether it be free agency or the draft that rusher opposite Nick Bosa. Okay, um, I think Armstead's coming back. Hargrave didn't have a great first year, but he'll be back. Bosa will be back. But the Niners have six free agents along their defensive line, and they don't really have an answer. For who's the opposite guy opposite Bosa? Um, they're looking for their D Ford. They're looking for that guy who, who you know, it, it wasn't Chase Young. It wasn't Randy Gregory. Um, hasn't it, it, been Drake Jackson yet. Hasn't been Drake Jackson yet. Um, Cleveland Farrell's not that guy. I mean, they need to find a big time pass rusher opposite Nick Bosa, and that's that's absolutely essential. Got to have that player. Number two, you got to have is they lost DJ Jones in free agency in 2022 and they have never had that that absolute plugger in the middle um they got to have that player and Ridgeway was okay and they've had some guy Kinlaw they've tried and they need that run stuffing defensive tackle Go, got to have it got absolutely got to have it they they weren't good enough against the run they got moved in short yardage They've got to find DJ Jones 2.0. And number three, it's the right side of that offensive line. No more fooling around, folks. You, as far as I'm concerned, you got your you get, you get a five man offensive line. I've watched all the film. I, I'm, you know, you, Trent Williams is fine at left tackle for another year, maybe two. Aaron Banks is the answer at left guard. Brendel's not the answer at center. Um, Burford and, and Feliciano are not the answer at right guard and Colton McKivitz is not the answer at right tackle. So you need to redo your offensive line with bigger, stronger, more dominant offensive linemen. Um, I've studied a bunch of them. I've got some great ideas as far as how I would go forward with that, but it's the center, the right guard and the right tackle need to be redone on the 49er offensive line. Now they need to, you know, find an extension for Ayuk. They need to find a linebacker to run with Warner. They need to find maybe one more corner, one more safety, maybe one more speed element, uh, receiver or running back, maybe a replacement for juice. And they have other needs, but the absolute off season has to include a number one rusher opposite Bosa, a run stuffing defensive tackle, 
of note and a new right side of your offensive line. What do you think about Graham Barton, the kid from Duke? I, I, I really like him um, a lot, but I also wouldn't draft him in the first round because I think he's probably going to be a right guard. Uh, he's going to be a, a guard or a right tackle. I don't think he has left tackle footwork. So um, I think I think Graham Barton is a potentially a left tackle down the road, but I think he's a, a mid second round pick and I wouldn't take him in the first round, but I do like him because he's versatile. He, he's smart. He's tough. He can play all five spots on the line, but I just don't think that you can play him at left tackle. And that, that's where you draft in the first round left tackles. What about the, what is it? The center from Oregon? who seems to be flying up an awful lot of people's charts. And yeah. you, know, you talk about center two, uh, you know, you, you, here's the thing. You're not going to have the pick of the litter with the 32nd pick in the first round. So you're going to need a little fall to you. Somebody doesn't like the value there. So you end up getting it later in the draft and maybe that's center. Yeah. I mean, um, the guy you're talking about is, um, uh, is, it, is the guy's name's like Jackson powers, something. Yes, Yeah. Something like that. It sounds like an action figure. Yeah. And, and he's a good player. I mean, he's, and, and I, I listened to a podcast the other day from uh, Dane Brugler and Brugler feels like he's you know, Jackson powers. Johnson is his name. He's the number one center. He's probably going to go in the first round. Um, I, I actually think center is the spot that they're best set at because I think they might be able to get by by moving McKivitz to center. They might be able to get by by starting Nick Sakel, who's Brock Purdy's roommate at center. Um, they, they've got a couple of different options at center, but um, Zach Frazier is a guy that I really like a lot. He played for West Virginia, same school that produced uh, Colton McKivitz, 6'3", 310-pound center. Um, I like him. I just think they need to get a little stronger at the point. I mean, they, they paid Brendel too much money. He's a good guy. He's a smart guy. They paid him based on this Pro Bowl alternate status. And um, I just I think that um, they paid him too much money. And the bigger nose guards, the DJ readers of the world, just own Jake Brendel. And that's why they don't get any push up the in the A gaps on the run, in the run game. So the Niners, I think, need a little bit more heft at center. B Brendel's more like 285. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I'd be looking for somebody in that 315 range. I'm surprised that in your list of three things that needed to happen, we didn't hear Dre Greenlaw's name, because to me, Dre Greenlaw coming back is going to be part and parcel of whatever this defense looks like, no matter who ends up coaching it. The good news that uh, came out last week was that Dre Greenlaw's surgery on his ruptured Achilles went very, very well. There's even talk of him being back by week one of next week, which is an incredibly aggressive timeline for him to return by. But again, Aaron Rodgers was feeling frisky about a return this year, and he's 40. The good news for Dre Greenlaw is he's only, he's only 26 years old. He turns 27 in May, so he's very much a young man, and young men recover better and quicker than older men. The Achilles is nothing to just roll your eyes at. That is a big injury. That could be a career alting injury and has been many times, but they've gotten better at it. You know, ask Kevin Durant, ask Clay Thompson. Uh, their Achilles obviously, you know, used to be a that's it for your career injury. Both those guys are still playing. Obviously, football's a little different than basketball, but at least six months of recovery and six months from now would be right around when the year starts again for the 49ers. So a lot of good news on the Dre Greenlaw front. And Larry, that's that's officially good for 49ers business. Yeah, I mean, this guy is he's the heart and soul of the team. I mean, you know, I want this guy back. Um, I don't care if he's ready in week one, week two, week five, week ten. Um, you know, he's entering the final year of his contract. He's scheduled to earn eight point seven million in salary and bonuses. None of that money is guaranteed. If he's still on the roster April 1st, two and a half million of it becomes guaranteed. Um, 2.1 million is what he would make in the CBA mandated injury protection if the Niners release him. And he was unable to pass a physical 
Um, so if they release him before April 1st, they save $6.8 million in cap space, and the $2.1 injury protection money would not hit their cap until after the season. So, I mean, a lot of it's about, I mean, this guy, Greenlaw is a stud. I mean, he doesn't turn 27 until May. He's had back-to-back 120 tackle seasons. Um, he's the heart and soul. I mean, I, um, you know, I, 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 I threw out, will the Niners bring him back? Because I was reading the Graziano piece saying that, you know, d- dealing with the cap, but now that the cap is, is as high as it is, um, you know, I think it makes all the financial decisions a little bit less urgent, a little bit less pressing, but I expect Greenlaw to be back. But I also think that, you know, maybe signing a guy like Aziz Al-Shair's insurance might be a really smart way to go. If not al Shair, um, there's a bunch of guys in this draft class at linebacker, including Cedric Gray uh, from uh, from North Carolina and Kalen Deloach from Florida State, who I really love. Um, but, you know, none of those guys are Greenlaw. So, yeah, Greenlaw is a, is, is a major part of – uh, their 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 team and I would not absolutely try to bring them back even if you have to make some tough decisions to do so hit the like hit the subscribe hit notify and don't miss a thing Damon Bruce Larry Kruger wake up is going three days a week Monday Wednesday and Friday beginning next week and we hope you plan on making us a part of your daily routine the goal is going to be a show that is from like 8 30 to 9 15 a tight 45 minute to an hour long show that fits into your morning that fits into your lunch break that is perfect on the ride home when you're coming home from work wherever you need us you'll be able to find us available on podcasts and of course right here on YouTube as well. When it comes to putting a team together, Larry, there is more wiggle room than any one year over the last year in NFL history. The NFL salary cap explodes by $30 million this year. The cap for all teams will be $255.4 million. Adam Schefter says it's because all the COVID math has pretty much been settled. And the extraordinary media attention and revenue of the last couple of years has officially come to bear. And this is incredible. In 1994, the salary cap was $34.6 million. That's when the NFL was a mom and pop operation compared to what it is now. Two hundred, A quarter billion dollar salary cap. That better mean Brandon Ayuk returns as far as I'm concerned. Like right there is get the Brandon Ayuk deal done in that one move alone. That's the way I see it. Well, I mean, it definitely, I, I, I see it the same way. I mean, um, and this, I guess, so they announced that the salary cap is jumping, as you said, 255.4. It's up over 30, 30 million. Last year it was 224.8. Uh, Pelissaro tweeted out that the increase is a result of full repayment of all amounts of advance monies by the clubs and, and, and deferred by the, by the players during the pandemic, as well as there's been an extraordinary increase in media revenue for the 2024 season. So that gets the cap up. Everybody thought it was going to be around 245, 250. Instead, it's 255. Um, yeah. I mean, this, this makes it so that you can do a few more things if you're the 49ers and you're not quite hugged up against it. You don't have to make such crushing, you know, crucial decisions. And you can kind of look, you know, run it back this year largely with, you know, when I say run it back, I mean, you don't have to move off of Iuke. Um, I, I, and yet I still think that, that it will be interesting to see. I, I still don't think it's a slam dunk excuse me, that Ayuk is back. Why? Because it's pretty clear that Justin Jefferson wants to reset the receiver market. And it just seems like there's always teams that have a hard time paying receivers. We saw it with A.J. Brown. We saw it with Devontae Adams. We saw it with Tyreek Hill. Um, I think it's likely the Niners re-sign Brandon Ayuk, but I won't say it's for sure. Um, they still have to find to that have, to finally have a consistent thousand yard receiver and walk away 
when you're an eyelash away from winning a Lombardi. T- I mean, it's just, you talk about like, it's the it's wrong risk. time to walk away from Robbie Gold. Dude, screw your kicker. This is Brandon Ayuk we're talking about. Like, it's the wrong time to walk away from Brandon Ayuk. 27 years old, prime of his career, peak of his powers, totally is something with Brock Purdy. There is kismet there. You don't break that up. You just don't. I hear you, but you're also talking about a receiver who you would be paying. If you paid him what he's worth in the open market, you're paying $50 million to two wide receivers. You're dead last in the NFL in pass attempts. Well, but you shouldn't and, be any more than, right? You should okay, be. But, but you yeah, also just played three playoff games. You just, you just played three playoff games where Brandon Ayuk got three catches in each game. So you're either you got to start utilizing this guy a little bit better than they have either way. I mean, I, I I agree with all of that. The fact that you can throw some serious man coverage on Ayuk and Debo and have so much success with it is another show. <laughs> you know that that's something that Steve Spagnolo found out too. You you press these guys hard; they're not who they hope to be in a lot of these games. Um, but I still think he is whatever Brandon Ayuk might be to the league. I don't know what he is to the 49ers is their best wide receiver by a full on country mile over brand uh, over uh, Debo Samuel. So I just, I wouldn't say goodbye to a guy like that for several reasons. Um, but you I, have I, to, you know, it's a negotiation. I mean, you have to see, I mean, I have no idea what he's asking for. If, if, if he wants, uh, you know, I mean, you never know. I mean, there's talk that Justin Jefferson wants to redefine the wide receiver market. What if he redefines it at $35 million? And what if I says, I want $35 million a year. I'd be like, you want Justin Jefferson kid. So calm down. You're not Tyree kill. You're really, really good for who you are, but you ain't quite them. So let's get back to reality here and talk about how we can make this work for you with guaranteed dollars that make everybody walk away happy when it's all said and done. Yeah. I think they're likely to get it done, but I don't know what he's, what he's asking for. I know that Parag's a tough negotiator. Um, I know that it's it, that he tries to save every penny at every turn and that he's not an easy guy to deal with uh, in these negotiations. He's formidable. So, um, you know, it makes me think based on the dialogue coming out of the IU camp, Damon, it makes me think that they've already exchanged numbers and are dramatically apart on on you know what what the two sides are looking for. Otherwise, I don't think I would have heard Ayuk's, you know, brother and sister coming out saying, you know, this is his he just played his last game in San Francisco and he wants to go to Vegas and he wants this and he wants that. Uh we'll see. We'll see. I, I would say this. I, I would be prepared to go either way. If, if if he wants some ridiculous $35 million a year, some crazy amount of money, right. and there's I don't think he's worth it. Yeah, there's I'll a walk that. away. There's yeah. a walk away. And there's so many receivers out there, both in free agency and the draft, that you could walk away. I mean, when I say walk away, you could also you don't have to do anything right now. You could roll this into next year. Now you got to have a conversation with them because the last thing you want to do is make an internal decision to deal with this next year, have him not be on board, not working out, but I'm not in a rush to move off of Iuk either because you could make an argument that Iuk has the best relationship on field chemistry, if you will, with Purdy than any of the other receivers. So you know, I think you absolutely want to get it done. But if there, if he gets crazy, um, I bet you you could probably get a mid first round pick and then some for him, and that might be the route they go if it, if things get crazy. I just know that it's hard being a wide receiver for Kyle Shanahan. Brandon Ayuk has finally mastered this very hard task, and not only would Brandon Ayuk's absence hurt the passing game, I think it greatly affects the running game as well. So I really do hope that they can bring him back. And again, with the salary cap increasing to two fifty five point four million, two hundred and fifty five million dollars. I hope that they can get it done. There's two things about that number that bother me, Larry. Number one, that the NFL has had internal layoffs. 
Like, how are you growing the cap by $30 million a team and laying people off internally? That is corporate greed at its most savage, disgusting level that bothers me to no end. Secondly, if you're going to go to $255 million, just go to 260 and grow the game day roster to 60 players. A couple of million dollars, Larry, is exactly how you take care of the back end of your roster. That's all you need. You know, I mean, we're talking half million dollar a year players at the very back end of your roster. And to me, a little more continuity, larger rosters, more guys practicing. For now, a season that includes one more game than it probably even needs or should. We all know that the NFL is never going to give back that game. As a matter of fact, how many years will it be? Another media deal before they even ask for another one. To me, consistency and continuity would be so thoroughly addressed if they would just grow the roster to 60. Football would be better. Better football means more people watching. Rinse, wash, repeat. This is how you make more money in the long run with a better product. I'll I'll go beyond that. Um, I'm a believer that the NFL brand is so strong right now that they are leaving huge money on the table. Football needs to be year round and you can't be, you can't play football year round with one team of guys and you could yet the structure and every, the marketing and everything that you have in place. I I think someday we're going to look back at, at, you know, 2024 and be like remember those cute old days where the where where the foot where uh you know the super bowl would happen and then there was that off-season thing and then there was no football and and we watched other sports oh yeah oh those days are gone i i really think that football's minor leagues would outdraw baseball's major leagues well football's football already does right football, but i mean Football's spring league would beat spring sports football if it was tied to the NFL. And what they ought to do is, is grow the game by even more than that, as far as the rosters and then, and then have an off season minor league spring league. That's like, you know, whatever, six, 10 weeks long, whatever it is and have a spring league. With, with 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 a total proving ground for the Trey Lances of the world for the for the uh for the coaches for all the different people that they want to give reps to you know the the young announcers the young coaches the young executives the young players the developmental league you want a G league you want an I want NFL G league I, I want NFL Europe in America and 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 what I want is I want the Niners minor league team wearing the Niners colors to play the Raiders minor league team wearing the Raiders colors in the spring with players that those teams own. And that right there would outdraw San Francisco Giants baseball. It would outdraw NBA playoff basketball. It would outdraw the NCAA tournament. Well, um, hold on, hold on. The tournament's still a big deal. I don't know if you're outdrawing that, but you would outdraw it locally. I'm talking about you. locally. I'm okay. not, you know, nationally. You're right, and but I'm saying, it, football's so big. There are people like I'm an I'm a I'm a football fan, but I'm a basketball fan, and I'm a baseball fan, and I watch other sports in the in the other in the uh, you know when the football's over, I watch baseball, and then I watch NBA. Um, but I'm becoming more of uh, the exception, not the rule. Now there's lots and lots and lots of people who, I mean, give you an example. I put out a question to my audience this week. I said, Hey, would you guys, I've got sponsor money. Would you like me to get on the road and go to spring training and cover giants baseball? Or would you like me to hunker down in my studio here in Walnut Creek and cover the combine? And cover the cover uh, uh, the combine and and free agency in the NFL. I'm off guessing season. you that cover the combine around eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, yeah, because people would rather 
there, there's more passion for 49er off season than there is for warriors. Will they, or won't they make the playoffs in season? There's more passion for 49er off season than wow. The giants, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the giants, uh, you know, baseball is, is, you know, here and, and let's go check out, you know, the giants and can they, can they add a player or two to their team? Today they signed, who did they sign? Nick Ahmed, the Ooh. veteran shortstop. Ooh. Dude, if I do a video on Dre Greenlaw's knee versus the Giants just signed Nick Ahmed, Nick Ahmed's going to get like four, 480 views. Dre Greenlaw's knee is going to get like 10,000 views. Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I've realized that too. I've taken a, a risk today with my 11 a.m. show, my thumbnail is warriors based which is probably going to nuke that audience before it even begins you know what i mean cuz it's just not a hey this is football come and watch football it's it i'm going to be talking about curry and the warriors and the nuggets last night and i had and- a great show the other night damon i you know how i get together with my my basketball crowd yeah i watched um, a little of it you had yeah, like so you, you had you had a fraction of the audience that cyrus was in the house yeah. uh frank red carl foster all the guys we we had some great dialogue went on for a couple hours you know it got um 300 people in the room 280 or something like that if you know you know we have almost a thousand sitting right here right now so i mean it's just football is big and minor league football does not work. We don't want it. We don't want NFL Europe. We don't want the USFL. We don't want the arena league. We don't want arena league Two. We don't want the XFL. We don't want it. What we do want is the 49ers and the chargers and the Patriots and the Rams and the Raiders. And if you just put, secondary football, but with the uniforms and the connections to actual NFL teams, the NFL audience will watch it the way they watch the draft. The biggest growing of sporting event in the country is the NFL draft. The combine sets records for audience every single time. The NFL, the NFL pie, just there's nothing. It's undeniably growing and there's nothing that slows down that growth if you took minor league football but attached it to the branding of nfl teams we would watch it and we would watch it in big number and um m patel says 93 of the top 100 shows on television are the nfl yeah yeah Yeah. so 94 so what are we doing we're blowing the nfl's blowing it they're blowing it right now, all because they think, well, you know what? It's, it's it, would, it would take money, and then there would be some liability, and we'd have to grow this and this and that. Dude, there'd be an entire second league. I, you'd you have know, an you'd commandeer sports year round. I I, mean, I, I think coming. there's an awful lot of merit to what you're saying. Let me just devil's advocate you for a little bit, sure. Because I think it was Cindy Crawford who famously said, yeah, I was the most popular model in the history of the world until I was on too many magazine covers. In other words, the only thing that stopped the Cindy Crawford train was her own overexposure. If you're asking me what is the too big to fail aspect of the NFL, the first rule of show business is leave them wanting more. And I do think that NFL does well with an off season that leaves people just rabid for it by the time August rolls around again. And I do think there is something to absence making the heart grow fonder and leave them wanting more. Um, and, and we do. We cover elements of the off season with a microscope that no one could have ever predicted. But I also think on just a hey kid, how's your body standpoint? A lot of these guys need an off season, um, and and you know you do understand though we're not talking varsity, about the same players, right? Junior, talking about junior varsity NFL all prospects. Well, like Jalen Graham did, did, did not play. Just, what did you just do to college football? Is college I mean, football still a thing? I think college football out out is absolutely still a thing. Um, there is no college football being played 
in the time that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a season that literally kicks off in the springtime and is going right now. So like you've got all these people. I mean, think about it. You've conditioned your audience to expect NFL football every weekend from like almost like their whenever they return from their summer vacation through February now. All I'm saying is you've got that audience commandeered. Keep them commandeered until until May. You know, and 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 run this thing simultaneous to the draft. And the draft, you draft guys, none of, none of the draft picks would be in this thing, but you're talking about your secondary. It, it, it would it would stamp out anybody who ever tried to step up on you. So anybody who was ever thinking about secondary football would never again go forward with it because you've got the spring covered and there's nothing left. Right. No USFL, XFL, none of that. USFL, yeah. US, USF or whatever it's being called next. I, right. Yeah. It, 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 and, and then and then what you do, it the key is the uniforms and the branding and what you do is you put you put these teams all within like 150 to 200 miles of your team. So Anywhere the Niners are within 200 miles of them, their their minor league teams got to play. Maybe some of them play in the actual stadiums themselves, but within 200 miles. Why? Because you you you're building like a little regional, um, you know, popularity. Right, let them play at San Jose State. Let them play. Let them play in Sacramento. Let them play. Um, heck, you can make it a barnstorming thing. Let them play all over Northern California. Um, but if you actually had you know, 15, 20 extra players per team. And maybe you had some of those guys participating who didn't play at all. Like, like all these guys that were on the practice squad practiced all year long, never played. Take your practice squad. Everybody's got a 16 man practice squad and just grow it. Just grow your 16 man practice squad. And you could even grow it in the off season. Doesn't you could make it, you could grow it to 30 and then fill out half your team with those guys and then half your team from guys you sign off the street that you that you own somehow and um people would watch it people absolutely would watch it i know i would watch it if you said that hey the niners you know whatever you know uh, nfl2 team is playing tonight and i can watch that or i can watch warriors celtics um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I may watch warrior Celtics, but I may not, I may watch that, especially since baseball is so tilt teetering right now. And you all, and there's no, you know, really, you're just talking about the NCAA tournament is the only thing that you would go against. But other than that, I mean, baseball's teetering, baseball's teetering the NBA regular season if you had real competition for those eyeballs would be teetering. Well, look at what the NFL's big Christmas day, right? You know, Christmas yeah. day used to belong to the NBA. It fell on a Sunday this year. So here comes the NFL and the NFL blew it away. Viscerated the NBA's normally robust ratings on Christmas day. So look at the all-star weekend for the NBA. It had the lowest ratings ever. Oh, wait a second until last year last year was the lowest ratings ever so nobody cares about that event nobody really cares that much about baseball as far as like baseball spring training and the beginning of baseball i love it well i love baseball too i mean i, I don't want to bag on baseball because i actually but, think the but it's teetering it's thinks. teetering um we'll, we'll get to all that in just a second um but you're right like the whole theme of today's show is clearly Football is king. The reason why you and I are going to be rolling out wake up three days a week and starting every single show with the 49ers is because football is king. And Larry, that brings us to our last football topic today, and that is the retirement of the king himself, Peter King. Uh, maybe the biggest piece of NFL news we'll get before the combine is that Peter King is retiring. His football in America column will be no more unless it is you know rebranded under somebody else's uh, banner. Um, this guy's been covering the league for 44 years. He spent at least the last 15 to 20 of them 
as maybe the single highest profile NFL media member um, in terms of old scribes, you know, not Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, Twitter superstars, but just an old ink stained wretch. If I can quote Ray Ratto, um, his columns, his appearances, his weekly interviews that he used to do on my old radio show were always huge ratings winners. Whether you liked Peter King or didn't, you paid attention to him. His name became synonymous with football. He did about as well of a job as being a company guy and calling bullshit on the league when appropriate. He was never perfect, but he was pretty good. He straddled a tough-to-straddle fence very well. He's a Hall of Famer. And at the age of 66, I'm sure he's still going to be around the game somehow, some way. But as a weekly columnist, he is now done. And all I can say is he's done it well. He's done it very, very well. He had a level of connections as a reporter that no other journalist I think is ever going to have around the NFL, Larry. His Rolodex, uh, the fact that he was around the league when it was a mom and pop league gave him a level of access that now if you're coming in to cover football, you are running into the biggest corporate entity in America and things done changed. So. There's never going to be another Peter King. And I salute him on an incredible career. Great guy. Um, Has great enthusiasm, natural enthusiasm. And I would say, I would say to any young person observing this, trying to make sense of why was this guy so popular? Because he had optimism yet. He's no, he's no, nobody's fool. He had intellectual curiosity and he had a thirst to know more. And that's really what it's about. I mean, as he thirsted to know more about the game, he shared it with the rest of us. He didn't just, I'm going to sit down with Kyle Shanahan and I'm going to go, you know, be in the Niner war room. I'm going to tell you what I gleaned from being in there. And, um, yeah, I mean, the guy's awesome. He's 66 at this point. He worked at the Cincinnati Inquirer. He yeah, later worked really at- young, by the way, 66 is young, man. I'll be 66 in a little while. Well, yeah, not, here's, not here's a little the thing. while, but the average, the average lifespan is what? 72, 77, something like that. Somewhere like in there. That. It actually Somewhere got there. worse in the last few years. So, yeah, I mean, so let's just say, let's just say he's got 10 more years on the planet. I mean, you may have 40 more years on the planet. You know what I mean? There are people that live past 100. But let's just say he's like everybody else, and he lives to 76. Do you want to, I mean, I know there's a say, the, the old saying is, hey, if you stop, you know, working, you're just like kind of waiting to die. Um, and I know, but I mean, if you really have a full, rich life, and you have children, and you have grandchildren, I don't know. I mean, I'm... I I'm, I'm going to be, fi- I'm 54. And it's like, I think if I did this for 10 more years and I was 64 and I was lucky enough to make it to 64, um, I would, I would want to spend the last 10 years just, just, you know, enjoying the back nine, playing a little I- golf, playing with my kids Hey, Damon and his wife want to get together and their kids just got back from college and man, let's go have a few beers over at Damon's house. Right. Hey, you know, I'd like between you and I covering football on just Sundays or seven days a week, like we try to do now. And yeah, I mean, it's uh, helped. uh, So Peter King wrapped up with this, Larry. I think that this is a very powerful paragraph and it speaks to everything that you were just talking about. And I'm sure you agree with this and have made choices that this will resonate with you. And it certainly is resonating with me. Quote from Peter King in his goodbye column. To do this job well, you have to have some selfishness in you. And you've got to miss time at home. Lots of it. I don't feel great about lots of those times, but I don't regret them either. To do this job well, it's a fact that some things in your family will suffer also. All three male members of my family, my dad and my two brothers, were dead by the age of 64 before ever even experiencing retirement. And my buddy Don Banks, he died at 57 in a Canton hotel room in 2019. All of it matters. And I just think Peter King, 
looked at his own life, his own family, his growing children that he wants to be around more. He looked at the cautionary tale of Don Banks, again, who, you know, sadly passed away in a hotel room, not surrounded by family and friends. And mortality, when your friends start passing away, it gives you a different perspective. And even though Peter probably had four or five really good more years in him, he just said enough is enough is enough is enough. And that's a that's a choice everyone has to make. I also think that, and then I don't know Peter, you know, I haven't talked to Peter, but I've, I mean, I've interviewed Peter, and I, but I haven't talked to him off the air about any of this. But he mo- recently um, overcame double pneumonia, you know, and people die from pneumonia. And maybe he, um, the overcoming double pneumonia, you know, I mean, it's, it's a young man's game, man. You're getting on flights, you're getting off flights, you're going from this climate to that climate. Um, it's difficult. It's a, it, you know, it's, I'm sure he can observe from being at home, but as he said, to really cover it well, you gotta be on the road and, um, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, I went to Vegas for the Super Bowl because I wanted to cover it, but I also made sure I got the hell out of there and I got to sit on the couch next to my 14-year-old and 17-year-old on Super Bowl Sunday and and be able to share it with them. And no offense, I mean, I enjoyed sitting next to you um, in New Orleans for the Niners and the Ravens, but you know what? Um you know, now that I'm 54 and I've got, you know, a couple kids that are almost out of the house, it makes me kind of cherish the time that I still have left with the ones that are still in the house. And, uh, so I just, uh, so I totally understand where he's coming from, but I really think maybe the double pneumonia that he had recently kind of maybe changed his thinking. Cause he seems like a lifer, but man, when you're sitting in that spot where you're like, man, this could be life and death, it makes you wonder. How many things would you would you do and how, you know, it's about quality of life. And, I'll tell you uh, what also is going on there that helps make this a choice for Peter. He cashed out. I mean, he, he was making an awful lot of money. The amount of money that 95-7 the game was paying him for his weekly appearances was an awful lot of money just for making a half an hour long phone call once a week. He was making tens of thousands of dollars on just 95-7 the game. So what's he making by hopping on Cowherd? What's he making by going on NFL Network? What's he making by going on NFL.com, TV, Sports Illustrated, all these things, Football Night in America? He made millions upon millions of dollars. And I'm going to tell you right now, after my millions upon millions of dollars, it's going to be peace. We're going to do it my way from here on out. Um, so. Good for him. You know, good for him. You guys just very good at what he did. Universal respect was pretty much given to him and he will be missed. He was a great storyteller. Like you said, he had a passion for the game that he shared. He never stopped loving the game. You know, again, I'm not trying to bag on Ray at all. And Peter King loved Ray Ratto and vice versa. And Ray doesn't even like a lot of people, but Ray at the end, you could tell he fucking hates sports. <laughs> you know, I mean, Ray is just had it with everything. He's as cynical as hell. Nothing is here for just fun. He hated it all. I could feel it sitting across from him every day how much he hated sports. Peter King is not that guy, you know, cut from a different cloth. So he will be missed for sure. Um, finally, last football topic of the show today here, Larry. Again, our our tight 45 minutes has already grown to something much bigger than that. I knew it would. Um, did you see the Cam Newton video? Like four dudes trying to jump Cam Newton. Let me tell you, and when we were in Las Vegas together, I was at the Club Shay Shay party, and I walked past Cam Newton as he was walking in. On the list of guys to not fuck with, Cam Newton better be in your top 10. He's approximately the size of a door frame. He is gargantuan. You have no, like, they didn't just give this guy an MVP. Like, he earned, I mean, he is a monster. And he had four dudes bouncing off him. All the meanwhile, he's wearing like a Hogwarts hat. 
and it doesn't even move off of his head. Dudes are bouncing off. I don't know what happened, what caused it, what the deal is. But a group of four dudes tried to rush Cam Newton, and he basically threw them off like a professional wrestler in a battle royale. It was it was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, good for Cam, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I don't. I, I did see the video of it. Um, where was that? It was at a, a seven on seven tournament in Atlanta, and apparently one of the teams. Is who jumped Cam Newton. I don't yeah. know why. I don't know how. I don't have any background on it. But um, having just shared personal space with Cam Newton, and somebody is saying here, a uh, caveman says, size is nothing when fighting. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> okay? Size and weight absolutely matter when fighting. It's not the end-all, be-all. There's an awful lot of damage that can be wrapped up in small packages you put the same skill that you have in a small package in a bigger package, it doesn't become less dangerous, okay? <laughs> like Cam Newton is um, the walking definition of he big. He's also, his his moment in the sun in the NFL was when he made a business decision not to fall on a fumble at his feet because he didn't want to get hurt. I mean, so, I, would, I don't I would know. Say it's more of his MVP season than that, but okay. You it know. was the same season, actually. Um, it was oh, the Super right. Bowl. That was, that was the same season. <laughs> but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I hate to see uh, mayhem in front of children. It seemed right. like there were a bunch of children standing around there. It's like that's scarring to them to see that. But um, if somebody wants to take some shots on Cam, you know what? God bless him. Yeah, it's that. I, 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 uh, I don't really, I don't really don't have any uh, warmth for Cam because Cam, Cam, I think's a hater. You know, at, at his core, he's a hater. And well, he hated like, Brock Purdy. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Well, no, you know, it's 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 he's, he. I don't even think he hated Brock Purdy. I just think he. Um, I think he stepped he into did, a conversation. He's a hater with, in that yeah. he wanted to be. He wants the money that that uh, Shannon Sharp is getting. He wants that money and he's and he's trying desperately to shortcut his way to that money. You don't name all of the Fox and ESPN hiring people if you don't have an ulterior motive for making outlandish statements. You're trying desperately to get on one of those Fox or ESPN morning shows. That's why you know who the, all the hiring people are, you know, right. well, you, you can feel that he, he knows that the spotlight isn't on him. He tried to swing it around back to him. I think he wasn't nearly as mentally prepared for a level of public backlash that his entry into the hot take business generated for him. He got incredibly defensive. The whole thing did sort of blow up in his face a little bit. Yet at the same time, here we are talking about Cam Newton. So, you know, maybe he even arranged the, the, the jumping of the four dudes who know who the hell knows but either yeah, way seriously. it was uh it was it was quite a quite a little video um that, that that popped up on the timeline this weekend um real quickly because we are you know a bay area sports show at least that's where we're based out here in san francisco um the warriors got dropped by the nuggets last night larry and uh, along the way nikola jokic just put together one of the single greatest basketball games you'll ever watch in your entire life. He had 32 points, 16 rebounds, 16 assists. The only two other guys who have ever done that in any NBA game, regular season, postseason, any professional basketball game ever. Oscar Robertson did it twice. James Harden did it once. And Jokic did it last night against the Warriors, where Clay Thompson, he came out with 23 points off the bench in the first half, and he finished the night with 23 points. So, Got half a game out of clay. They needed a whole game out of clay. And the Warriors got blown off the court in the fourth quarter when uh, they scored, I believe, what they did, 16 points in the fourth quarter. That's not good. Um, they've lost seven times this season in games where they've had a 15-point lead. The only other team in the NBA with that many losses, up 15, is the rebuilding with the number one overall pick of last year's draft, San Antonio Spurs. So, you know, I, I love that Draymond is saying, yeah, we're feeling frisky and we are playing well and our efficiencies are going up since I've returned. And he's right about all of that. They're nowhere in the, they're not even in the weight class of the Denver Nuggets. And that's been proven with the Nuggets winning 10 out of 11 
and sweeping the season, season series this year. Yeah, I mean, these people that were saying that the Warriors could win the title, I mean, my God, dude, check yourself into uh, drug testing. I mean, my God. Well, I mean, the Warriors had a nice little couple games, and all of a sudden they can win the title? Win the title? I mean, come on. What are we talking about? Denver's entire team is like in their prime. And and you're going to somehow win the title. Um, Steph was bad last night, by the way. He was one for 10 from beyond the beyond the arc. Yeah, dude, in order for them to, to even reach the six seed. And this is the thumbnail that I created for the 11 o'clock show is that Steph basically needs to be a basketball Jedi from here on out. He's going to have to Obi-Wan Kenobi this entire team to the sixth seed if he's able to even do that. And I don't know if he can do it all by himself. Um, he's got a little bit of help. That's for sure. Draymond's playing better. Hopefully, Clay is finding his own level of who he is now in this league by being moved to the bench, and we'll see if he stays there or not. Pajemski is a good squabbler. I like Trace Jackson Davis, obviously. Kaminga's coming into his own. There is a better Warrior basketball team today than there was a month ago, two months ago. But a title contender? I mean, get out of here. It's, it's, yeah. It, yeah, calm down. Now, they're not winning anything. Um, they may be able to pull an upset if they get the right team in, in the playoffs, uh, but they're not, you know, they'll be checking right. out. There'll be a, there'll be a second round checkout team um, for sure. They're probably going to check out the first round, but uh, they may they, pull they an upset and make it into the playoffs. I mean, can we be totally honest here? There's a very good chance that they're not. So they had 29 games remaining after the all-star break. They got to go like 20 and nine to really be thinking anything about a six seed. Um, to be, but they can make the play in the play. I mean, in. They're, yeah, they're they in the play in. They're in the play in right now, and they could beat the Pelicans in the play in, uh, or the Lakers or the Mavericks. The, I, I think it's possible. They might be able to upset somebody in the first round, right? But it won't be Denver. Can um, I give you a dose of reality that you don't want? Sure. Warrior fans don't want to hear this. The Warriors are now three and fifteen this season against teams on a fifty win pace. So, you know, teams on a 50 win pace, those are the contenders. The teams that are three and 15 against teams on a 50 win pace are by definition, not the contenders. So we'll see what the Warriors do. I mean, they, again, if they go straight nuclear perfect between now and the end of the year, they might be a six seed. Go ahead and look at the amount of losses in any of their championship years. They've already broached that. I mean, it's that this is not a team that looks like it's about to win a title. Having said all of that, having said all of that, um, Steve Kerr has an extension, making him the highest paid coach in basketball. I don't have a problem with that. I think Steve is the best thing that has happened to the Warriors, not named Steph Curry or Joe Lacob. Um, the interesting thing about the extension, though, Larry, is that it ties him directly to Steph Curry's timeline. And I do think that when one is done, the other will be done too. Highest paid coach in the league. Yep. Yeah. Um, good for Kerr. You know, he's he's 501 and 264 in the regular season, 99 and 41 in the playoffs. So he's got a he's got a 650 win percentage, 655 win percentage in the regular season. He's got a 707 win percentage in the playoffs. He's won four titles. He's made six finals appearances. Um, the guy's a good coach. What I, what I like about Kerr the most is that he brings the whole team along. Last year was his worst year easily. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, as a bench player, you know, he understands. And he's played with superstars. He's played with the greatest. Um, but he also understands the importance of bringing the entire group along from A to B. And that's the thing about the NBA. I mean, you could make an argument that the Warriors' last title was an example of they stayed together. Everybody else that was in the championship discussion kind of fractured along the way, and they were the last man standing. And who knows? They may be able to get one more ring on that same kind of let's keep everybody pulling the rope in the right direction. Um, but good, good for, I mean, it was a great hire. Imagine if Steve Kerr, instead of taking the warrior gig had taken the Knicks gig, 
You know, that's the thing. I mean, oh, that, that was the other thing. I don't know if you saw that, but Mad Dog said that uh, he's talking about Curry the other day. He's like, he's a nice little shooter. I mean, it's like, talk about a talk about a hypocrite. If that guy had played, if Steph Curry had played the balance of his career at MSG oh. and had, <laughs> Chris would be sitting there bowing that this is the greatest player that has ever walked the face of the earth. Well, a nice if, little if, shooter becomes the single greatest shooter in the history of the sport real quickly for, for yeah. Chris in that moment. Yeah. I mean, I love Chris, but I mean, if Steph had played in New York, the the level of his of the love for him, he would be like the greatest player in the history of the league by far. And instead, it's like, ah, oh, you know, he's a nice little shooter. So it's just kind of to me, um, I, I laughed at that. But yeah, good for Kerr. Good for Kerr. And I the people that, you know, think that, you know, there are people out there and I'm I'm. I know them. There's some in the media, some are in the, you know, walking around town who feel like Kerr's overrated. Um, I get that, but I, I really believe that his approach of kind of bringing everybody along from A to B is a major key to his greatness. And also, he, I, I think he, you know, he's also having a chance to, 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 uh, you know, coach a very, very special group of players and i think he understands it um he understands where he's at good for him i'm i'm happy for him i will say this though I, joe lakeup is an interesting guy and i i'm not re there are people that want to say that he's the greatest owner in the history of bay area sports i'm not ready to go there yet i i gotta see where it goes from here because his fascination with trading for lebron and his we're never going to take a step back approach to, you know, winning, I just don't think is very realistic. I mean, I, I want to hated the idea of bringing in LeBron um, to I, Joe just seems so. I don't know. He's weird. It's like he's obsessed with winning, but then he also wants to go to the fit. He's also kind of has this soft side where he wants to go to the finish line with Clay and Draymond and, and Steph. And it's like, I don't, you know, which is it, you know, are you, I don't know. It's like, it's almost like the two sides of Joe Lakeup are going to fight each other at some point because he loves the idea of going to the finish line with these guys, but then going to the finish line with these guys almost guarantees that you won't win a title for a long period of time. And he seems so intent on winning a title, another title that, um, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what to say about about Joe. I feel like he's 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 showing his youth as an owner by wanting two things that really don't align. He wants to go to the finish line and be this nice guy, but then he also doesn't want to take any steps back and he wants to contend for a title and he talks in huge statements about doing such and I don't know. I don't think you can do both. So I'm really eager to see what the next five to 10 years of his ownership look like. I agree with an awful lot of what you just said. Joe Lacob is the perfect sports owner. He's perfect. He wants to win more than guys on his own team do. Like this is exactly who you want owning a team. The guy who wants perpetual success. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at some other owners. Look at who owns the Giants right now. Do you think perpetual success is even something that they take a sip of? No, no nothing. Like I, I, I like an owner with impossible to meet standards more than I like an owner that is devoid of any standards to even compete with. So um, I, I think Lakeup's pretty damn good. I, I do. Pretty um, damn good, yes. I, as far as the Giants owners, too, you bought the team in 1992 for $100 million. It's currently estimated to be worth $3.8 billion. And yet you have your fans arguing that not signing Blake Snell, Cody Bellinger, um, and other big time guys is a prudent decision. That's how, that's how wrapped up some Giants fans are in the Giants and their and their desire to kind of like be positive at every turn, a hundred million dollars. It's worth $3.8 billion. And you're apologizing for the owners pocketing $420 million 
of revenue last year and not spending it, not reinvesting it into the club. And well, it's like you want to call yourself a smart fan, but you're gonna you're gonna give the owners of the team license to pocket money when they've already made more money than anybody ever has in the history of San Francisco real estate. I mean, it just kind of shows that the giant fan is, 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 has in, in a lot of ways is disconnected from reality. And it's like, they look at, it's like the old, the old saying, those who shit on you aren't necessarily your enemies. And those who take shit off your back aren't necessarily your friends. It's like, you know, it's like they they don't understand that they're apologizing for a group of people they should not be apologizing for. Well, look, I actually think that they dodged a little bit of a bullet on on Cody Bellinger. Bellinger is going to play better at Wrigley Field than he would at AT and T Park or whatever the fuck they call it now. But they um, could have had Reese Hoskins, and they could have had everybody else. And well, they, go, here's the thing. Go, here, so your offense is going to be terrible officially limping to the finish line of all nine innings that you play. Like if, if any time the giants score more than six runs should be cause for a celebration at, at, at China basin, there are all star caliber pitchers out there starting with Blake Snell, who is available today. Anyone can sign Blake Snell today. Anyone can sign Jordan Montgomery today. Anyone can sign, you know, Hy uh, Hyun Jin Ryu today. You can sign Mike Clevenger today. Shit, you could go out and get Brandon Belt today. Do something more. It, the fact that Farhan is looking at his team and going, my team's on the field with this level of talent still available is a major disconnect between the reality of the league and this team's position in it. And Farhan's ultimate failure, even as we are frustrated by a lack of free agency and a big name showing up, Farhan's failure is in this farm system more than it is in free agency. No doubt. They have the lowest rated farm system in the, in the NL West. James Wilson is saying we got Bill Belichick 100, 100, 100, 100. I'm going to Twitter right now to check that out. Hold on here. Uh, what is it, Schefter? I don't know. I don't know, but I don't see it, so I don't. Hold on, Larry. I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll trust in you. Adam Schefter has not tweeted anything in the last two hours. The last thing go. Adam Schefter tweeted was Bengals head coach Zach Taylor uh, talking about franchising T. Higgins. So, yeah. so who's now. got it? Who says that they have it? Um, James Wilson. We got Bill Belichick 100, 100, 100. <laughs> who's James? Who's James? I don't know. He's probably on your side. No, I'm just joking. Um, I'm just joking. He's, he's not. He's come. He's he's officially yours, Larry. He's he's officially mine. I uh, you know. Oh, wait a second. We have a Copen Copenhagen interpretation. Ban him, Larry. He's trolling. But Kittle Karn eighty is that worth a ban? Is that Adam worth a ban? Schefter just announced Adam Schefter. What did he announce it on? On TV. Hold on a second. Hold on. We certainly can't wrap up the show until we no, know what no. is going on here. And I have one point to make on the on the combine too that I still have to make. Oh, but, but I, I tell you what, Larry, while you make that point, let me do a little research here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'll be watching the combine, right? And and I'm doing a video later today on the guys at the combine uh, to watch for, right? So the, so you know me, I'm I'm all about the combine, and I will watch it. But here is, if you look at the top forty times in the history of the combine from wide receivers. Let me list you the fastest wide receivers <laughs> in the history of the combine. John Ross is the very fastest. He ran 422 in 2017. Henry Ruggs 427. Now he's incarcerated, but Henry Ruggs. Marquise Goodwin 427 2013. Tyquan Thornton 2022 428. And then I'll just r run the numbers to run the names for the rest of them. JJ Nelson, Jacoby Ford, 
Darius Hayward Bay. More names look, than touchdowns. As yeah. a, more na- Darius Hayward Bay has got more names than catches. I mean, he, the guy, <laughs> it was like, you know, it was like he had one hand instead of three. Uh, three, he's three names, but only looked like he could have one hand. Bayless Jones Jr., Paris Campbell, Andy Isabella, Curtis Samuel, Calvin Austin the third, Will Fuller, Trey Palmer, Danny Gray ran 433 three in 2022. McCole Hardman, DK Metcalf, who's good, Philip Dorsett, Brandon Cooks, Mike Wallace, Bo Melton. Uh, DJ Chark, John Brown. You got a Avon whole bunch of Austin, never worse. Never has Ryan been. Swope. Never worse. You got a whole bunch of track stars who masqueraded as football players. Of the 25 wide receivers listed above, we can safely say that 16 of them are either busts or trending towards being busts, or it's maybe a little too early to tell. The lesson is don't get caught up in the 40 times. For, I mean, the, the best wide receiver in the league um, a couple of years ago was Cooper Cup. He ran four six two. Um, they're they're the forties are what everybody watches, and it's easy to be like, "Wow, these guys burned up the track." But outside of DK Metcalf, of all the receivers that I just listed, they've combined for five Pro Bowl appearances: two two for DK Metcalf, one for McCole Hardman, one for Mike Wallace. One for DJ Chark, and Very and Hardman awesome. made his Pro Bowl as a returner in his rookie season, not as a receiver. So all I'm saying is, and I believe me, I, I'm I'm an advocate for some. I mean, a speed kills, and it's and if you ask Shanahan, I've asked him this question ten times. He really believes that these burners who run run the top off the defense who stretch the field are vitally important to him as a play caller um, because and he, and they Gray create the space. What's that? And yet he doesn't get Danny Gray on the field or Gray is hurt, whatever. Right. Uh, you can't get on the field. 40 times matter. 40 times in wide receivers and in cornerbacks, probably overrated. 40 times among linebackers and offensive linemen do matter. Definitely linebackers. Yeah, because there is a level of speed required at those positions now to either get out and make the block or to beat the block or to run with your your running back and get the right angle on tight ends. That's where I think 40 times matter. They get over-exaggerated in importance of wide receivers and in corners. No doubt. No doubt. So it just just kind of goes to show that you know, will I watch the combine? Hell yeah, I'll watch the combine. And there, and I did do, and I am doing a video on it later this morning, guys to watch for, and it will be a decent video. But just remember that the 40 time doesn't mean everything. And but, in some cases, doesn't mean anything. We should get t shirts made. It'll be a decent video. <laughs> It'll be a decent video. It'll be a decent video. What do you guys think of uh, Wake Up with Damon Larry? a decent video they'll make some decent videos out of that out of that out of that live stream thank you very much for tuning in to what we hope you agree was a decent video if you thought it was a decent video today how about a like you could take it even one step further with a subscribe you can take it many steps further by becoming a member of either channel or both to support what larry and i are doing but a like and subscribe A like and subscribe would be absolutely lovely, if you would, please. Thank you very, very much. Larry, I see we did get a couple of Super Chats in here today. so We do, but we also have this one from Steve Cass. It's not a super, but he says the Nesson Network, which is the New England Sports Network, says the Nesson Network YouTube video stated that Bill Belichick was spotted with John Lynch in a deep conversation. When? Is is Bill part of the Niners? He was spotted with John Lynch. There when did go. the conversation happen? Is that old footage? I need to know more about this Nesson video that people are looking at. Okay. <laughs> Wait a second. We got more, more, more chats that make me laugh. All right. We'll get to all of them right here. Here we go. We'll go right down the list in the order they came. This one, loner incognito. Please, no internal hire. Might as well bring back Jim Tomsula, but would not mind Vrabel. 
that story about Vrabel being too physically imposing. I mean, is there any bigger joke than that? Well, at what point are you in the wrong business if <laughs> physical intimidation is a part of your hiring process? I, that just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like saying, you know, I really am into auto racing. I just don't like when people drive fast. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, that's funny. All right, we got this one from Blood Moon. Bryce Huff would be the one splash move. Better, better than... Uh, then Brian Burns, less pricey. Steelers released a center. Any interest there? We need a solid nickel. Um, there you go. Faithful to the Bay. Um, I like Bryce Huff. I agree with that one. Bryce Huff would be one of my he, – he, he would be a great outside rusher next to Nick Bosa. Vernon Freeman. 49ers need a defense coordinator. Kyle won't second guess in game situations. Maybe Kyle will pull a full mastermind and decide to name himself defensive coordinator. And that would not be good. That would not be good. Again, Kyle needs to take one thing off his plate, and the entire defense comes off your plate if Bill Belichick is the hire. So do that. Yeah, seriously. You know, here's the other thing, and I've been saying it. I, I don't know if you've been saying it. I know I've been saying it for a couple of years now, and when I have said it, 49er people have literally reached out to me saying, I wish you wouldn't say that. But I think Kyle Shanahan needs – not just a great defensive coordinator where he doesn't have to worry at all about the defense. I think he would really benefit from having a Belichick, Belichick like uh, guy on the sideline to be able to kind of better manage some of the in game decision making that he has. I don't know if you want to say struggled with, if you want to say has had hit and miss success with. But I think Belichick would help them twofold. He would he would take Kyle completely out of the defensive meeting room, but he would also have another guy that he really, really trusted that he could consult with on the headsets in the middle of games on how to manage some of the biggest games. I think it would matter. I think it well, would make it, an impact. It, this is me saying that Kyle needs a run the ball coach. You just need somebody to look at him in the game sometimes and just say, hey, Kyle, just run the ball. And, and, and yeah, Bill Belichick would be that. I look at him. He's a wartime consiglietti. You can go full godfather. I, I like to go fraggle rock here. He's the trash heap. He's the oracle that every fraggle gets to go to for all their best advice. At one point in time, even though he's the defensive coach, Bill Belichick and Brock Purdy are going to go out to lunch together. How great will that be for Brock Purdy? You know, like just to have, you know, like, hey, you need a Jedi? Would you like Obi Wan Kenobi? <laughs> I mean, like, this is is Bill he, Belichick Yoda. Yeah, yeah, you get you get Yoda. Yoda's <laughs> even better than Obi Wan Kenobi. I mean, they both hey, they both wear hoodies. There you go. Good night, everybody. Sports don't build character. They reveal it. No, that's great. Uh, Kevin Wood, who's been a member on my channel for two months. It doesn't have to be a billion-dollar league. Just take USL Framework and put the NFL brand in there. Use it to test new rules, new streaming ideas, yes. et cetera. This would be something that you'd think that if the league was looking to offer, like, hey, Netflix, you want to be involved in this? Hey, uh, you know, you know who I'd offer to? More than just Thursday night? Who? I know you didn't see this bowl game, but if you went back and watched the Toledo bowl game, one of the most genius things I think I've seen this year was bar stools. Bar stool. bar stools broadcast was exactly what this needs. That's exactly what that league needs. A bar stool like broadcast, but with like, you know, backup just, players, just guys being dudes. Just guys being dudes, having fun, make it entertaining, make the broadcast entertaining and try to acquire, try to aim your broadcast towards younger fans because younger fans are not watching baseball. Um, James Wilson, Larry, this is the one that made me laugh. I was asking someone in the chat. We said that we got bill. Please don't ban me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> not banned, James. You're okay. Yeah. James, you're not banned. You're not banned. I saw uh, one guy admit he's like, yeah, I just got tired of the baseball talk. I was looking to spice things up. <laughs> Fair it enough. Worked. It worked. Fair enough. Fair enough. We got Greg very excited there for a second. We did. <laughs> Greg Argisi. Love it if Steve Young could be the OC. No one better. Too much money in the bank. He's got too much money. The hours are too ugly. All right. You so we had I'll tell you, Steve Young, 
and Steve Kerr remind me of each other when I just think of some of the greatest communicators in sports. I mean, Steve Young is one of the ultimate communicators. The message sent, the message received, it's spot on. It's so, he's so good. He's so good at what he does. And it would be great to see him involved in a way that just wasn't punditry. I think Steve Young has an awful lot to offer no matter what group he would step into. He's that elite of a human. Uh, no question. And and his some of the things that he shared about his conversations with Brock Purdy, I know Brock has benefited. I absolutely know that Brock has. Um, every time I talk to Steve Young, I feel like, Wow, I've I've really learned something about the game, even if it's just nuanced about, a, 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 you know, a, a point about people. It has nothing to do with the game. It's like he's just so so cerebral on such a such a regular guy level. You know what I mean? Um, that it's just you do gain a lot of of perspective. I loved his line of Super Bowls aren't won; they're taken from bloody hands. And it's like, you know what? Damn, if that wasn't true. Uh, we should, we should, by the way, maybe we should, instead of calling it Wake Up with Damon and Larry, it should be Bloody Hands with Damon and Larry. <laughs> Ripped <laughs> from Bloody Hands. Bloody Hands show. We took the ratings of the morning and we ripped them away from everybody else with Bloody Hands. <laughs> All right, James Wilson says, love the OG Krug show. Fire, like, and sub up. Now James is trying to throw money at a problem. Uh, James, it's okay. You don't have to you don't have to super chat us. We're not we're not on the verge of dumping you. Um I mean, if I you do that again, you're out. No. Um next year says Larry, what is your opinion on the quarterback situation? What quarterback yeah. situation? Yeah, you uh, have I like I like Brock I mean, Purdy. How about this? For the first time in a long time, there isn't a quarterback situation. How great is that? I love <laughs> no, it. Seriously. I'll say this. You know, here's my opinion on the quarterback situation. I'll be doing a mock draft on this. But I really believe that you're going that the Niners are going to keep either Darnold or Brandon Allen, but not both. It's probably going to be Brandon Allen. And so that means you got to have a third quarterback. I love Joe Milton from Tennessee. I just think he's just He's so big, so strong. I mean, this guy can throw the ball 90 yards in the air. And I'll tell he's, you right now, he's got a torn ACL or he had one last year. So I might be interested there. <laughs> <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> you always like the guy with the, with the, who can throw it 90 yards. Greg. Here's my question. Can he throw it to a meat cheese on Union Street? <laughs> can, can he can he throw it? You know, can he throw it from Levi's to a meat cheese can onion? Can he put it in the trunk of the Miata? Can he put it in the Miata? Can you hit the tight window? It's a tight. It's a small car. It's got a very small trunk. It's a small window, Krug. You're so cute with your quarterbacks and your mock drafts. Uh, Eric Shun. After we signed Bill Belichick as the DC, we signed Tom Brady as the quarterback. Oh my God. Done. Uh, next year says Dayton or Larry. What is your opinion on the quarterback? We just gave it to you. There isn't one. Know. Digital Drew is always good. Says, Damon, I don't like that we look alike. No idea why. It just bothers me. LOL. I feel sorry for you, too. <laughs> sorry. You're going gray quickly. That's the thing. People <laughs> think I'm older than you, Larry. I, I said that I was born in 75, and people are like, what? You're younger than Larry? This is, this is, uh, this is, this is. It's a very distinguished beard. Older than it looks. Earth well, and we started, by the way. Older than I am. Have you, since you mentioned this at the beginning of the show, we can come full circle. Did you see in the new season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Jeff has dyed his hair? Yes. And that, did you see the lawn jockey? And they tried to, they 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 broke the lawn jockey and it was a black lawn jockey. And instead <laughs> they tried to get one, but they could only find a white one. And then they, and then they put, they, they made, they darkened his face. And then, then in the heat of Atlanta, the lawn jockey starts to the, the paint starts coming off and you can see Jeff's hairs paint coming down. 
I mean, it's just an awesome show. Well, and it's, it's also an incredible show. They're totally mocking like Rudy Giuliani for the, you know, the running press conference thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, it, it's just, yeah. No, the, the show is happening on, there's three dimensional chess being played in every single Curb Your Enthusiasm episode this season so far. It's been, it's been great. Last night's episode was hysterical too. I just love Susie. Um, that's one like my favorite character. That's Jeff's wife. And I love the way she talks when she's happy with Larry and when she's pissed at Larry. Yeah. When she likes him, she's like, Hey, La, Hey, how you doing? La, you know, with this very new New York kind of, Hey, La, and then you fucking idiots, <laughs> you, you, you morons, Larry, get out of here. Larry. You know, oh, she, she hates Larry when she hates Larry. The way he, she says his name is just awesome. Get my Sarah awesome. gun off your balls, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> By the she way, got a, she got I, a dog. Jillian got you. Me. You jerks. You assholes were thought that my dog was eaten by a coyote and you kept playing golf. Remember that? Did you see what that? What can one? we do? What can we do? You didn't come and check on me. Uh, it was hysterical. <laughs> but um, by the way, a couple of birthdays ago, Jillian got me a Theragun. Oh, my God. That thing is part of the reason why I'm still alive. I'm going to be honest with you. The Theragun is incredible. Get yourself a Theragun. <laughs> if you are aching, if you got pains, if you need a massage and don't have anybody to work on you, get yourself a Theragun. It's like 300 bucks, and it's the best three. How about this? You can afford like two... 60 minute long massages for the price of a Theragun or have something that can massage you better than any masseuse for the rest of your life. Uh, get a Theragun. Maybe, maybe we can get them as a sponsor, Larry. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Uh, we uh, told you the show would be 45 minutes long. We've just eclipsed two hours. All right. <laughs> digital Drews is every time I hear bulkier, the razor, I have to go. LOL. <laughs> Rakeeb Jumani looking forward to you guys getting me through the football off season. Exactly. Thank we you. will be here for 45 minutes or two hours plus 45 minutes <laughs> plus Monday, 15 minutes. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, beginning on Monday of next week. Again, Plus Mania 3, which will be attended by Lawrence Kruger himself, is at the Halfway Club, 4 o'clock Sunday, March 3rd. Come on out. Drink with good, like-minded sports fans. Enjoy yourself. My buddy's new bar is awesome. You will like it. It's in the locals only part of San Francisco out here on Geneva, Crocker, Amazon. You got to be from San Francisco to go to this bar. No tourists. So um, we hope that you are there. Thank you very, very much for tuning in. And hopefully everyone has as many ACLs at the end of this show as they did in the beginning. Um, one last note. I'm at 39,609 subs. Help me get to, to 40,000, hopefully by later today. Um I also want to say when I was in the sixth grade, I was playing a baseball game at Crocker Amazon and my, my a buddy of mine, Wayman Strickland, who would go on to be a great athlete at Reardon high school, which is backs up to Damon's house, um, took me over the fence at Crocker Amazon in the sixth grade, in the sixth grade, he parked one over the fence it was like high school. It was like a high school dimension for that field, too. And I threw it hard, as hard as I could because we were buddies as kids. And he swung as hard as he could. And he hit a titanic bomb off me at Crocker Amazon in the sixth grade. And as you can tell, I'm still not over it. And by the um, way, Larry, since you did bring up Reardon, let's just say deep condolences to our friend Joe Shasky, butcher boy. He just had his father pass away last week, funerals later this week. And he is a, a great San Franciscan Papa Shasky was so little love to Joe. Uh, very, very sad that he lost his father. It's something that both you and I have been through. So we know it's powerful medicine. We wish Joe and his family the very, very best. Yeah, absolutely. I can't say anything better than that. Um, Joe, we're, we're thinking of you. You're in our prayers. And on that note, we will we'll call it quits on this show. Uh, tune into Damon's channel. Tune into mine. Thanks for supporting. Uh, wake up and have a great rest of your day. Peace. <laughs>